Amen. Can we give God a round of applause in this place? Amen. Before, before I read this morning, I want you to do me a favor. Would you put your hand on your heart and lift your other arm up? If you come from a background and you're not used to raising your hand, just have your neighbor raise it up for you. It's, close your eyes for a second and pray this with me before we read God's word. Father, open up my eyes. Help me to know you more. Jesus, I want to know you. Amen. This morning, we're going to start with reading by Hebrews, reading Hebrews chapter 1. Start, to start us off, it says Hebrews verse 10 through 12, chapter 1 says, You, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we give you praise in this place. We thank you that you are indeed worthy to be magnified. God, we are grateful that today we serve you, we love you, and we worship you. God, there's not a better place to be than to be in your house, to sing songs of praise to you, to set aside all the troubles, all the chaos in this world for just a little bit to come and bow before a king, the creator of all things. God, you are worthy of our praise. Jesus, we lift your name on high and we ask that today as we dive into your word, you would speak to every one of us as we talk about who you are, that you would declare to us with purpose who you really are. Help us leave this place today more mature in the knowledge of who you truly are in our lives, what you truly have done. God, we give this time to you. May you be magnified, be glorified, be lifted on high. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray all these things. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Great. Man, it's so good to be here with you this morning. Um, as we start this new series, I'm excited. You know, some people may think I'm really good at planning, but I really am not, okay? I know it's Halloween, and I know it's a day that the devil thinks he has claimed, but I love that we are coming on a Halloween Sunday to church and we are talking about who Jesus is this morning. That's what we are doing. We're going to literally discover who is Jesus. And we're going to reclaim this day for the purpose of God. That's what we're going to do. And I'm excited for tonight too. I'm already wearing my t-shirt, ready to go into the community, be the light of Christ, talk about Him today, serve the community. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you too are. But today... If you have your Bibles, feel free to open up to the book of Hebrews. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the back. If you use your phones, please silence your phones. You know, I got to tell you, on various occasions in my life, I've had the, the chance or the privilege to sit down with people from different backgrounds, such as atheists, such as Buddhists, Muslims, and people who were scholarly level even in these kind of religions. And I've had the chance to sit down with them, to share Christ with them, and on often, on many occasions, people have asked me this question when I've sat with them. They always come and say, prove to me that Jesus is real. Prove to me that Jesus is real. And in the beginning stages of my faith, it would always intimidate me to hear that question. How do I prove that He is real? How do, how do I prove that to people? But as I grew in my faith, I still have a long ways to go. As I matured in my faith a little bit and understanding of the Scriptures, now I... I am excited when somebody asks me that question. I, I, I accept the challenge with enthusiasm. I, let me show you who Christ is. But oftentimes when people ask me, show me, prove to me that who Jesus is real, I always ask the questions like this, prove to me that you are real. And people look at me and say, what is wrong with you? I'm standing in front of you. What is, are you out of your gourd? I am in flesh standing before you. And I say, and I say to them, uh, how, how do I know you are not a figment of my imagination? What, what if you're not real and I'm just making you up? And they say, no, 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 come touch my flesh. Touch my flesh, I'm real. Some people get angry. Come touch my flesh, I'm real. And then I ask them, for example, I ask him a question like this, do you have any cash on you? 
or, or do you have a keys to a very expensive car, like a Corvette, or like, a, like a Porsche? And they say no. I say, well, you must not be real. <laughs> because if you don't have what I want, you see, if you don't have what I want, how could you be real? And the thing is this, we look at God in the same way. God is real. His, his existence is real. There's evidence of His existence all around us. The fact that you don't see Him is because you're looking for Him to be what you want Him to be. And, and what we're going to study in the book of Hebrews, I am amazed by this, by this letter in the Scripture. Why? Because it's so deep. And what I, um, I've got to tell you this, we, we're going to dive deep into this today. And I hope that you brought your notepads if you don't have them don't worry just try to remember as much we're going to take notes we're going to have a lot of notes to take if you're a note taker today because i want you today i want you to write down if you can because i want you to go home we're going to talk about who jesus is okay and i want you to go home and write all these things that i tell you for example if i tell you jesus is this write it down and i want you to go home and throughout the week think about who jesus is throughout the week remember these things that the scripture says that jesus is and why is that so important because the more you know who he is the less this world bothers you. The more you know who He is, the more you realize that you are safe in His hands and, and there's nothing that can be a harm to you. But as we look at the book of Hebrews, I also always tell you in the beginning of a series, I tell you that I am not a commentator or a commentary, okay? I am not here to tell you about the background of the book, who wrote the book, and, and what date. Those are important things. You should know those. You should, you should research them all. If you don't have a good commentary, come talk to me. I will direct you to a good one. But if I were to tell you two quick things about the book of Hebrews is this. First one is there's a lot of dispute about who the author of the book of Hebrews is. Some people traditionally say it was Apostle Paul. Some people say it was Luke the doctor who wrote the Gospel of Luke who, who also wrote the book of Acts. Some people say it was Barnabas. Some say it was Apollos. Some say it was Priscilla. Some say it was Koala. Eh, all these names are thrown out, okay? But ultimately, it doesn't matter who the author is because the main author is always the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit transcribed it because it was necessary for the people of the time and today to know what this passage, what this chapter, what this book really says. The second thing is obviously the title suggests Hebrews. It was written to the Hebrews at the time. Now, you may say, well, I'm not a Hebrew. Hebrews are Jews. You may say, well, I'm not a Hebrew, so it must not apply to me. The thing about it is the purpose of this letter is so amazing. In fact, if um, I'm going to throw some big words out, but don't worry because of the big words eventually as they come through the sermon. But I, I think this purpose of this letter was an apologetic letter. In, apologetic simply means the defense of the faith. And I think this letter was written to defend who Jesus is. And throughout this whole thing we will see, through this whole series, we will see who Christ really is. And I'm, I'm fascinated by it. But... It was intention, the intention of the letter was that it was intended for people, for two groups of people, I would say it, for Jews who were on the verge of letting go of the church and going back to the Jewish tradition. They were disputing and arguing about going back to the Jewish tradition because they thought what they had before was better. So the author writes this, Holy Spirit really authors this, and says, no, Jesus is better. Let me tell you who he is. The second group of people was those who had one foot in the synagogue and had the other foot in the church thinking they can keep both. And you may say, well, that's synagogue. I don't go to synagogue, so I'm safe. But the reality of it is it's for people who have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. So it's still very applicable to both, both of our lives, both groups of people, right? Now, you guys still with me? Because we're going to dive into this, and we are going to dissect portions of this. And some of you may get bored because we're going to read and read and read, okay? But, but I think it's so powerful if you pay attention to what God really wants to say. Verse 1 is where I want to begin. It says, Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God has spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in the last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed, the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. So it says, In the beginning, before time, before Jesus, God spoke to His people through prophets. For about 1,800 years, about 1,800 years, 39 books of the Old Testament, God spoke through various ways, through miracles He spoke, through judges, through kings sometimes, through, um, through many different things, through angels He spoke. And, but one of the primary ways He spoke was through prophets. In other words, before Jesus, oftentimes a prophet would receive a word, and they would come to people and say, Thus says the Lord, and either, either people would listen or they would reject 
But it says when Jesus came, and it says the last days, and we've talked about this before, last days meaning from the time of the birth of Christ to the second coming, God has spoken to us through Jesus. So before Jesus, humanity needed, needed a mediator to communicate with God. We always needed a prophet, a priest. We needed somebody who was holier than you and me to go talk to God, to, to go and, and bring our sins before Him. But when Jesus came, this is the most amazing thing about Jesus, but when Jesus came, you and I have direct access to God. You and I can bring our sins directly to Him. In other words, all of us, the Scripture says, become priests, become a royal priesthood. All of us get, gain access to His presence. This is why, and I don't mean to bash any denominational perspectives or things, this is why the Catholic confession is redundant, is useless. Because you already have direct access to God. You can just bring your sins before the presence of God and He will still hear you. You don't need somebody to be a mediator. Christ is that mediator. Okay, but then verse 3, I'm going to read verse 3 and 4, and then we're going to read verse 3 and 4 over and over in pieces. Okay, you guys ready for that? Verse 3 says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than others. And than, than theirs or than the angels per se. His name is more excellent. So let's, let's dissect this. Okay, verse 3, I'm going to read a portion of it, and here's what I want you to do. As I read a portion, I'm not making any of this stuff up. All of it is in here, okay? In other words, this is the simplest note-taking note that even, even, even if you miss it, you could still go back and write it down. All you got to do is to change something, say Jesus is, instead of saying He is, okay? Simple. It says, He is the radiance of the glory of God. Jesus is the radiance of the glory. If you're a note takers, write this down. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. Okay? So what does radiance mean? Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. Radiance is, is not a reflection. Okay? So for example, when the sun shines, the moon reflects the light of the sun. It doesn't have its own light. Jesus is not a reflection of the glory of God. Jesus is the glory of God. Radiance means... Radius means um, the heat, the presence, the nature. Everything about God is within Jesus, and Jesus manifests that out. He is the glory, the presence, the nature of God that is being manifested through His existence. And that is, um, that is so powerful because when you realize that, that He is actually this, this presence of God, He is actually the nature of God, He is shining. And one of the other things, side note right here, is this is the radiance of the glory of God. And what I love about it is glory is, is a word I love in the Scripture. In the American culture or in the English language, it's become kind of poor in translation. But in the Middle Eastern cultures, the word glory, it means a lot more. It means the weight. He's the heaviness, the radiance of the heaviness of God. Now, I'm not talking about fat. I'm talking about the weight of God that when it falls on His people, makes His people unshakable makes his people without the ability to be shaken or broken. He's the radiance of the glory of God. So what, who is Jesus? The first thing he says is the radiance. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. You guys with me so far? And then he says, so we're going to read this again, okay? He is the radiance of the glory of God, verse 3, and the exact imprint of his nature. The exact imprint of his nature. So if you're note takers, write this down. Jesus is the exact imprint of God. Jesus is exact imprint of God. Now, what does imprint mean? The word imprint, again, is one of those words in English language translation doesn't really do justice. Imprint comes from the Greek word character, which we draw the word character from. The word character literally means um, the distinct qualities, moral or personal qualities of a person. So, so Jesus is the exact character of the Father. He's the exact character of God. He's the same as God. In case you forget who He is, Jesus is the exact character of God. Now, why is that so significant? Because before Jesus, people could only... Here's a big word coming, okay? But don't worry, I'll have the definition for it for you. Before Jesus, people could only understand God anthropomorphically, okay? Now, anthropomorphism means this, attributing human-like qualities to something, to a God, to an object. 
So before Jesus, would, people would only look at God and understand him anthropomorphically. They would, they would say, well, God's hands, God's eyes, God's face, but they'd never seen him. But after Jesus, they actually walked with God. They actually saw God. They actually could relate to God, so Jesus made God relatable to people. And aside from that, because of Jesus, I can look at your faces and see Jesus in you. So I can know what he looks like because he lives in you. And this is powerful. Now, the next one is really exciting to me. He says, He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. But also, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. What does uphold mean? So I want you, if you're a note taker, I want you to write this down. Jesus is the upholder of the universe. Now, what does uphold mean? Something upholds means, means to, to maintain, to keep, to protect. It's um, the sustaining ability. In other words, would you believe me if I told you this, that if Jesus were, led to, were to let go of the universe, the universe would collapse? If Jesus were, were just saying, you know what, I'm done with this universe, boom, it would collapse. And by the word of his mouth, he created it. By the word of his mouth, he created the universe. He's the upholder of the universe. Now, this is so exciting to me because uh, there's nothing that is hidden from him. There's nothing that can stand against him. And uh, there is scientific proof, okay, scientific proof. I'm not making this stuff up. But scientific proof that says in order for life to exist on planet Earth, okay, just the Earth. Now, I'm not even talking about the way the, the system of the universe or, is organized to allow for life to be sustained. I'm not talking about the solar system, that the way it is put in place that is allowing life to be sustained. I'm talking about just the earth itself. Science says that in order for life to evolve, okay, there are four fundamental forces that need to be absolutely finely tuned. These four forces are gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. Now, I want to set aside two of these, okay, just two of these, the strong and the weak nuclear force. Just focus on electromagnetism and gravity. In order for life to exist, if you just look at those two, in order for life to exist on planet Earth, gravity and electromagnetism need to be in such fine-tuning state that the chances of that to randomly take place is one in ten duodecillion. Now, what, what that means is, is 1 in the power, 1 in 10 to the power of 40, or 1 with 40 zeros attached to it. In other words, it's not 1 in a million that you say, oh, there's still a chance. It's not, it's not 1 in, in a billion. It's 1 in 10 to a decillion just for gravity and electromagnetism to take place. Now, Josh McDowell, in a book that he wrote called Evidence, he describes it like this. He, he simplifies it a lot more. He says, it's just like this. Imagine one billion continents, one billion continents covered with coins. One billion continents the size of North America covered with coins from the bottom to the moon. Okay, one billion continents size of North America covered with coins from earth to moon. Now you take one of these coins. Now I don't even know how many that is. Okay, you take one of these coins painted red throw it in the middle somewhere and blindfold somebody and say, go pick the red one. What are the chances of that person actually being able to do that? The chances for life to randomly come into existence is very, 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 very minimal. Just for two forces is one in ten to a decillion. That's it. Now, we're not even talking about the existence of the universe. We're not talking about how the solar system works. We're talking about two forces of nature. And then he says in Colossians 1.17, says, And Jesus, he says, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In other words, if you were to let go, if you say, I'm done, all of it would collapse. Now, why is that so important? Because interestingly, I never go to bed at night. I don't know about you guys, but I never go to bed at night wondering, I wonder if the sun is going to come up. I never go, to, I am worried about, oh my goodness, what if the sun doesn't come up and I freeze in the morning? I, I never worry about it. I don't know if you do, maybe there's something wrong with you, but I never worry about it because I trust the system, a system of creation. I trust it. I never, you never go to work, you never go to work wondering if the day would come to an end because despite how slow your hours may go, time travels at the same speed. 
And at the end of the day, you know there are certain hours in, in, in the system of, of, of the earth, and you will go home. You never doubt that, but somehow we doubt the Creator. This is Jeremiah says, in Isaiah, I'm sorry, excuse me, um, Isaiah 41, it says this, God is speaking to people, it says, Fear not, I am with you, do not, dismay, do not be dismayed, for I am your God, I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let me go back to this, listen to this, I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will, I will uphold you with my righteous hand. The upholder of the universe says, I will uphold you. Yet, you and I have confidence in the creation. The sun will come up. But we have lost confidence in the creator. We forget that he will uphold us. He is the upholder of the universe. Hebrews 1, 3 again says, in, He is the radiance of the glory of God. The exact imprint of his nature he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. If you are no takers, here's your next one. Jesus alone is the purification for all sin. Jesus alone is the purification for all sin. What does that simply mean? It means sin cannot destroy sin. To simplify this even further, when computers were initially invented, None of the inventors of computers assumed that one day they would be infested with viruses. And the thing about a computer virus, what is a computer virus? A computer virus is a code, a corrupted computer code that copies itself without the permission of the computer user. And it regenerates itself to a point where computer becomes unusable. Now, if you want to get rid of a computer virus, do you go buy another virus? Or do you go buy an antivirus? Now, what does an antivirus do? An antivirus wipes the virus and replaces the broken code with the adequate original codes or restored codes. Jesus is the restoring code for the DNA of humanity that has been corrupted by sin. He alone, I don't care what religious background you come from. You could be Buddhist, you could be Muslim, you could be, I don't know, whatever else, atheist. You could be whatever you want. There is no other way. Sin can never bring purification to sin. It's impossible. The only way for sin to be removed is for somebody who is pure code to come in and take that away. And that is Jesus alone. Amen. In fact, in fact, um, it says in Isaiah 59, it says, God saw, he said, he saw that there was no one. He was, he was talking about Jesus before the arrival of Jesus. God saw that he was, there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. God saw that our codes were so broken. We were filled with this, and this virus and he alone could be the antivirus. So Jesus came, died on the cross for the sins of humanity. You guys still with me? We only have another three hours to go. Okay, just... just. <laughs> okay, I, I'm just kidding. Only two and a half hours. <laughs> so, Hebrews, again going back to verse 3, says he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So the next thing you need to write down, Jesus is superior and more excellent than all things. Jesus is superior and more excellent than all things. Why? Because nothing else can purify sin. See, remember the first verse we read said, before Jesus, God communicated through prophets. But these prophets often heard from God by, through angels. An angel of God came to them oftentimes and said, Thus says the Lord, and they did reveal this message. Before Jesus, God communicated the message of salvation through communicators, through prophets. The angels brought the message of salvation. The prophets brought the message of salvation, but Jesus brought salvation. That is what makes him superior to all things. That is what makes him more superior than all things and more excellent than all things. Now, it's ironic because it's Halloween, and, and one of the things about Halloween is that we know that Satan is a fallen angel. Now, we know that he's a fallen angel, and his claim is to take you away from, from who God is and what God has done in your life. So he creates these senses of fear within us. He, people dress up in gory things, and then they, they, in a sense, worship Satan. 
But the reality of the scriptures is that angelic beings, we know they were powerful. And we know Satan has some sort of power. We know that. Angelic beings are powerful because we know, for example, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, God set a cherub to be able to guard the tree of life. And nobody could, nobody could overthrow this cherub. Or, or you see in, in Exodus chapter 12, an angel of God went and brought death to all the firstborns of the Egyptians and all those who didn't put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. One angel did that. You read, in, um, you read in 2 Kings chapter 19, you read the story of one angel going and bringing death to 185,000 men of the enemy's army. Or you read in, in, um, in 1 Chronicles 21, you read God's, God was about to bring destruction through an angel. An angel had his sword pulled out to destroy the earth, and God relented. Now, why does that matter? Because Jesus is superior to all these powerful beings. It is at the word of Jesus that they actually get to act. It is at the word of Jesus that they actually get to do what God has commanded them to do. So Jesus is superior to them. Now, why, why is that so important for you and I to understand is because, because Romans chapter 8, verse 31 says, What then shall we say to these things, Apostle Paul says, If God is for us, who can stand against us? Amen. Jesus is superior and more excellent, and He has chosen to come down to die on the cross for the sins of humanity. He has chosen to give Himself up for you and I. And if He has chosen that, His word is superior, He is superior, and there's no demon. No angel, nothing. It can stop that redemption from him to come to us. Nothing. Now, I know, I know you guys want to go home and take a nap, but just a few more things, a few more things. A few more things. Verse 8, if you jump to verse 8 real quick, it says, um, verse 8, it says, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, you, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. So what is he saying? He's saying this. Jesus is, if you're note takers, I got I to gotta go through this quick because we're running out of time. But he says, Jesus is everlasting, ever present, ever existing. Okay, Jesus is everlasting, ever present, ever existing. What does that mean? Ever pre- everlasting means that there's no end to him. Ever-present means he's not only omnipresent, meaning he's at the same time he's right here with, my, with us in this room, he's also in, in 100 years ago, he's also in 2,000 years from now. He's ever-present. Now, for you and I, we can't fathom that. But he's also ever-existing. He has not had an origin, and he will have no end. He is ever-existing. Now, this just focus for his ever-presentness for a second. Why is that so good for you and I? Because it means that before you and I walked into a problem... He was there. Before you and I come out of the problem, He was there. He has seen the outcome, but aside from that, in the beginning of creation, He planned a way out. That is how awesome He is. But then look at verse 10 and 12. It says, And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth. In the beginning, and and the heavens are the work of your hands. The heavens, he says, they will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never come to an end. Your years will never end. So in other words, he says, no takers. Jesus is never changing. It's a big word. He is immutable, unchanging. Jesus is never changing. Now, why is that so fascinating? Because if God changed, the minute you take them off, He would stop loving you. But the fact that He doesn't change is the assurance of the fact that you don't have to worry so much when you upset Him. He still loves you. And He says, Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, verse 38, says, For I am sure of this, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. Nothing. Do you know why? Because He's never changing. If He changed, it would be written differently. We say, well, I am sure that death, angels, life, all those would change God's love for us. So just don't mess up. But instead He says, I'm sure that He won't change. Because He's immutable, because He's unchanging, you can have confidence that God's love for you remains. doesn't matter how horrible you have been. 
He still will forgive you. And the last one, verse 13 says, And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? In other words, Jesus is ever victorious. Ever victorious. What that means is that there is no power, no angels, no demons, no government that can stand against Jesus and overcome Him. Now, I know for some of us, we look at that and say, hold on, hold on a second. You say, no, sir, I, I see what you're saying, but it doesn't look like it. Some of us go back and say, well, but He died on the cross. I mean, that, he, was, he was defeated. No, the Scripture says that He wasn't killed. He gave Himself up. See, the Scripture says that He came as a lamb to be crucified, but when He comes, He comes as a lion of Judah. He comes as a roaring king to, to overthrow the powers of hell and satan, satanic things. He gave Himself up as a king. Now, this is amazing for you and I because He cannot be overthrown. Now, you may look at the world and you say, you say but, but it looks like He's winning. It looks like you look at the chaos in our world, you look at the wars going on, you look at all these crazy things happening, say, but Satan is winning. How, how is he ever victorious? You know, I have two daughters and sometimes they want to wrestle. Now here's the thing. I know that all it takes for me is one push to overpower them, one push. But I don't do that because it gives them confidence to fight me sometimes. It gives them confidence to think that they are victorious. It really does. Now, parents, you know that. But at the end of the day, I always know that I could defeat them when it comes to wrestling. And God looks at you and I, and sometimes He gives us the confidence, thinking, oh, I'm going to fight God. He says, okay. At the end of the day, I know I'll defeat you. Same thing with Satan. Satan thinks he can overpower God. At the end of the day, the end is written. He's ever present. He's already been to the end. And he knows and he's written it for us. Satan is defeated at the end of the day. This is so amazing for you and I because it is the fact that he's never defeated that allows us to know that because he's victorious, you and I will also be victorious in him. Now, I could go so much deeper in this. I could be here till next week without eating and just telling you about who Jesus is. This is, this is. this is so amazing and so deep. And for now, I just want you to think about this. I hope you get a chance to write or recall all these things. You go through this passage again and write who Jesus is. Why? Because when you're going through a hard time in your life, and trust me, this week it will happen, the best thing to remember is to come back and say, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. Jesus is the exact imprint of the nature of God. Jesus is the upholder of the universe. Wait, wait, wait a minute. He's holding the universe in His hand. That means He can really hold me too. He is everlasting, ever-present. He is ever-existing. And so suddenly your problems don't really matter because He's ever-victorious. Suddenly nothing really matters in your life. And, and the question I have for you as we finish is, do you understand who this Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? Do you understand that? Do you understand what He has done for you because of His great love for you? Do you have that relationship with Him? Because listen, I, could, I don't have to prove to you that He's real. Listen, science proves it even though they don't want to accept it. Everything in the realm of existence proves that He is right here in this very room because He's ever-present and He's wanting to hug and touch and love every single one of you. So if you don't have that relationship with Him, I am here for you. Dave, Doug, our staff, my wife, you're all here for you. Our elders are all here for you. Come talk to us. If you're watching online, go to lifepointtucson.com slash connect. Let me know. I will call you myself this week. Because for me, it is important that you know who this Jesus is and I will tell you even more about Him. We could sit down till next month and talk about how awesome He is. As I finish, would you mind doing me a favor? Would you stand up to your feet? I want to read a psalm. Many years before the coming of Christ, many years before the book of Hebrews was written, King David wrote these words saying pretty much the same thing the book of Hebrews says. He says, The Lord upholds all who are falling 
and he raises up all who are bowed down the Lord upholds the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season you open your hand and you satisfy the desires of every living thing you are the upholder of the universe the Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works the Lord is near to all who call on him to all who call on him in truth he fulfills the desires of those who fear him he also hears their cry and saves them the Lord preserves all who love him but all the wicked he will destroy my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever would you say this last verse with me my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever so if the Spirit of God leads you to come kneel up here in your seats if the Spirit of God leads you to just bow your heads or raise your hands give him glory Father, I give you praise in this church, in this house. Father, I give you glory that you have reminded us today who Christ really is. The radiance of your glory. The exact imprint, your character revealed on earth. The upholder of the universe. I can't even fathom that. And God, I, I just want to ask for forgiveness for myself and for the rest of us here who at times doubt that the author of the creation, the one who upholds the universe, has said, I will uphold you, and yet I doubt you, but yet I trust in the creation. How foolish is that? God, forgive us for that. And Jesus, I pray that the things that we have read about you today, we have talked about you today, that we would carve those in our hearts. Because I know that as we walk out of this room today, Satan is going to come tell us all these kind of different things about who you are. But remind us, Lord, that you are indeed the radiance. You are ever-present, everlasting, never-changing, never-failing, ever-victorious. You are mighty in all your ways. And there is none who can compete with you. There is none who can stand beside you and be victorious towards you, God. There's none who can overthrow you and take your kingdom away from you. You are one and only true God. And we are blessed to be your children we are blessed to be yours we are blessed to know that our God has looked down on us and has seen that we cannot overcome on our own and that you have come down so that your own hand would achieve salvation for you we thank you for Jesus Father we thank you for your son we thank you for your Holy Spirit Father we thank you so much today God, we love you in this place. May you be glorified in our lives. May as we walk out of this place that you would remind us and allow us to be a, a reflection of your radiance to this world. In your holy and precious name I pray.